one of his biggest fans, his daughter, Lila. Lila? Hi. First of all, I'm not Brad Meltzer. <laughs> Um, well, luckily, I am his daughter, Lila Meltzer, and um, first of all, I want to thank everyone for coming here today, and I just came from another book signing, so that's very interesting, <laughs> and um, so I want to thank you guys, um, and today he has two very interesting books. I am Amelia Earhart, and I am Abraham Lincoln. And I hope you all enjoy it. So here he is, Brad Meltzer. <laughs> Let's hear it from my daughter. Come on, right? <laughs> so... I will tell you that uh, she is right. The best part is that she's doing shtick, right? That was shtick, right? She's like, I was at a book signing right before this, and boy, are my arms tired. Like, um, this is is truly the hometown signing, without question, um, because Books and Books is our home, and it has been of all the bookstores in the country. I always say it. I will always say it. Um, this is my bookstore. This is our hometown bookstore. This is my favorite bookstore, and it, and it is truly the best in the country, not just because I'm here. And uh, a huge thank you to everyone at Books and Books, most importantly to Mitch Kaplan, who's here. Um, <laughs> who anyone in this community knows is uh, as, as responsible for the, the, what level of intelligence there is left in Miami. Um, I credit all to Mitch. And, and we know that that bar, right, it's hard to pull that bar up. Um, but truly, thank you, Mitch. We love you and always been supportive of every different kooky, crazy, different kind of book we want to do is always the first one to say yes. And years ago, when no one cared about me signing and nobody wanted me to sign at their place, Mitch was the one who said, please come here. We'll have you, whoever you are, Brad Meltzer, let's go and do it. And um, and I'll tell you that there was another bookstore that didn't let me do it. I won't tell you where it was, Aventura. Um, <laughs> and you saw what happened to them. So uh, with that said... A couple of thank yous first before I start. And the best part of it is, as, as you heard, we were at this other book signing. And as I was doing the thank yous of my family, I had mentioned my brother-in-law, my sister-in-law's names apart. And I, and I was going to my head going, I feel like I forgot someone. I forgot someone. I forgot someone. And because I was saving her to the end. And when I got in the car, I said to my wife, I said, there's someone I forgot in your family. Who did I forget? And my wife looks at me and goes, me. <laughs> so, and I knew it because I asked her. So I'm I'm gonna be smart um, this time and not forget her by mentioning it up front. Uh, so, but the first people I do want to thank, and these are the three people I need to thank because it's the only reason these books exist, and that's my kids. Um, and they're here tonight, and you saw one of them, and the other two are here, uh, tearing apart the kids section like nobody's business. Nobody will wreck a kids section uh, faster than my youngest. He's the best at it. So thank you to Jonas and Lila and Theo. I love you, and these books are for you, and you know it. They wouldn't exist without you. Let me also thank um, my, uh, my family who's here, and Amy and Matt and Adam and G, and my in-laws, Bobby and Dale. Uh, they are truly, with the passing of my parents, have embraced me and, in, in an incredible way, and I love them very much. And uh, this time I will not forget my wife, who I was saving for the end last time, but I will say uh, I love you, hon. And this book is, she's, she's always dreamed these dreams with me. And every time I come in, and if I was a smart person, I should do another thriller and another thriller and another thriller. That's what pays the bills. Um, but when I said to her, I want to do these kinds of books, she's like, you need to do them. You have to do them. So thank you for supporting every different dream there is. M much appreciated. And of course, to this audience who's, uh, I mean, family and friends and the people who come over and over and over again. I see people from every walk of my life here. So thank you for always being there. Um, Ryan, Allie, and Benny are here or no? Okay, I'm not thanking my niece and nephew because they're not here. <laughs> Although Ryan could be watching on the internet. So thanks, Ryan. I love you. Um, no, my niece and my nephews are, are also here uh, in spirit. So with that said, let's talk about these books. Um, when I started these books, uh, it was really actually interesting to me because they started because my kids, I was tired of my own children looking at reality TV show stars and loudmouth athletes and thinking that's a hero. And I say that all, I say to them all the time, I said, that's fame. And being famous is very different than being a hero. And I thought to myself, you know, 
on, on the history show we do and the books I write, I have so many better heroes than that for them. We have Rosa Parks, and we have Amelia Earhart, and we have Abraham Lincoln, so many better heroes. And the goal was is not just to do a set of books where you can see their stories and all the stories you know about them, but the real goal was to show you them when they're younger. So you see Amelia Earhart when she's a little girl. You see Abraham Lincoln when he's a little boy. And the result of that is you see them uh, as just regular people. I think what, what happened and what's happened today is we put them on such pedestals, they've become these almost lowercase g gods. And, and they lose their humanity. We just say, you know, Abraham Lincoln, he was president and he... Not died. Look, a little kid just yelled, died. <laughs> One little kid in the front row, you can't got to be like five years old, just yelled, died. And, and my kid actually always knows that. My, I, someone gave me a little Lego piece today. And, and, and you're going to go sit in the back very soon, I promise you. I promise you're going to. Your mom's coming for you right now. You have no idea. So my kid gets a little Lego piece today. It's a little Lego Abraham Lincoln from the Lego movie. And he says, Dad, I drew the guy who killed him. Only my kids know that, right? Because that's what we teach in my house. It's the decoded house. And, um, and basically, you're nine. I could, you know what else you are? That's a good joke I got going on you. And so, um, to me, I, only Heckler's nine years old, right? Only in Miami. So, the point is, is that for me, what, what you say of Abraham Lincoln, he freed the slaves. We say he freed the slaves, he freed the slaves. Every kid in America knows he freed the slaves, but it doesn't mean anything to them. Because it's just something we've beaten to their heads without t teaching them who this person is. And to me, the most important part is um, that they're regular people, ordinary people. No one is born a hero. No one. Rosa Parks is not born a hero. Amelia Earhart is not born a hero. Abraham Lincoln is not born a hero. And it's not great destiny that magically takes them to who they are. It's their hard work, their perseverance. It's their ability to stand up for someone in a moment when everyone else might not. And to me, that's the lesson we need for our kids. That's the lesson we need to teach for our kids. So I started with that. And listen, um, I want, what I wanted to do is rather than just tell you about the books is really show you how we build a children's book. Because um, Chris Eliopoulos and I, and he's my, you know, he's my partner on this, and I'm going to show you some of the pictures that we do. And hopefully this will work as we get this PowerPoint working. We got anything going up there yet? Let's see. Okay, so here we go. So here's I Am Amelia Earhart. Here's where it starts. Here's where it begins. And obviously this is where, where we begin is, is obviously with this cover. This is the final product as we see it. But when we start with it, Amelia Earhart doesn't just come out like this and we say, who here's the magic. What we start with is actually a very different version. And this is, oh, I went forward. Let's go back. So there's the first version that Chris drew. Now the key version, right? No nose. So what do we like? If you like no nose, raise your hand. If you like with a nose, raise your hand. Okay, so now you have to basically, we have to figure out what we want. So we, of course, agree. We, know what, we look at this, we like this, but we want something different. Um, we're going to get this working. So then we start, we give her a nose. Amelia Earhart gets a nose. And now here was the very first page that Chris drew for the book. I am Amelia Earhart. And, and the goal was to give her voice, to bring her back to life. And we looked at this very first version, but then we said, you know what? We want it to breathe. We want it to be open. We want it to feel big. And so Chris takes this with her eyes closed and turns it into this, right? A nice wide double page spread. I am Amelia Earhart. And now we get the font that takes place. And, and this is where the story begins. And you'll see her story is, you know, this little girl who's told you, you're supposed to wear dresses. You're not supposed to do unladylike things. And Amelia Earhart's like, you know, she doesn't like that stuff. She doesn't agree. And I can tell my daughter that Amelia Earhart's amazing because she flew across the Atlantic Ocean. But my daughter reacts to that, and she's like, big deal, Dad. Everyone flies across the Atlantic Ocean. What else you got? <laughs> right? I mean, she's not impressed. But if I tell her, and here's the story I'm going to show you. You'll see in the book that Amelia Earhart, when she was seven years old, built a homemade roller coaster in her backyard. And this is her doing it. She takes a wooden crate, and she shoves it up to the top of her tool shed on the roof. And then she puts two giant planks on the side of the tool shed so she can race down them. What she does is she actually puts lard, greases lard on the wooden planks because, you know, when she puts the roller skating wheels on the bottom, you want to make sure you move fast, right? And she does exactly that. And then she gets on top, gets on top of the roof in this rickety thing that's on roller skating wheels, looks down at her sister who, you know, says, I'm going first. And her sister looks up and goes, yeah, genius, you go first. And then this is the moment, right? Here's the moment. And she's like, in three, two, one, and here's what I write. This is how we do a children's book. This is what it says on the page for the illustrator for Chris Eliopoulos to draw. It says, soaring in the cart, arms holding tight, so excited, mid-scream, this 
is the greatest ride ever. Now, clearly, my descriptive power is fantastic. This is the greatest ride ever. Just draw that, <laughs> right? Just draw the greatest ride ever. That's what it's going to be. And then, of course, you can't just put the, what, the, what the picture looks like. Because this, you know, you have to put what the picture looks like. I always choose that. But you also have to have the dialogue that's going to be on the page. And it's Amelia Hart saying, I still remember the wind in my face. My stomach seemed to sink. I was flying. And then Chris Eliopoulos takes these genius works of mine. And he gives me this. Here's the first draft. This is what it looks like first. This is what I see, what comes across my computer, is basically his rough pencils. Just saying, is this even the composition that we want? And we look at it and we say, maybe we like it, maybe we don't, maybe we should do it a different way. And she's, you know, we, you can't even really tell exactly what's happening. You know, she, she's coming off. And then he does another draft where he'll add some kind of details, make sure that we feel that moment of lift off the curve at the bottom. Um, and then when we like it, he puts some inks to it. And now it starts to really take shape, right? Now it's, it, you know, this could be the greatest flight ever of all time, especially when you add color, right? And now you add the most important part of all time, the key part to this entire thing, the most stupendous part, my words, right? <laughs> and there it was where she says, I feel the wind in my face. I was flying. And truly, in history, this is a true story, this is the very first moment where Amelia Earhart flies, seven years old, on a crate. And she, when her stomach bottoms out from under her, she says later, I want that feeling again. This is her first flight. And this is what we tell in the story. And in that moment, for my daughter now, when, she, when I tell her that story, she's like, Amelia Earhart is just like me. She's brave and she's daring. And most of all, she's fun. Amelia Earhart has come back to life in spirit. There she is. And that, to me, is the goal of the book. And so we also, you know, we, then we do Abraham Lincoln. And it was funny, yesterday when I was in Dallas, someone said to me, you know, what I love about, and I always knew this part, what I love about Chris Eliopoulos and his art uh, is I met Chris uh, on, of all places, Twitter. I met him on Twitter. He was a total you know, stranger on Twitter. I'm the, clearly the last person on earth who still thinks it's okay to meet strangers on the internet. Um, but I'm, you know, he just seemed, you know, he get, he, I just seemed like a good person. He was a lover of history. We talked about Decoded. Uh, I knew his work in comics, of course. And uh, he had done Spider-Man, and he's done the X-Men, and he's done Batman, and you name it, and he's drawn at the Fantastic Four. And Franklin Richards, I knew his books from there. And uh, what I love about his work is that it has this kind of, this great mix of what I can only call Peanuts Charlie Brown mixed with Calvin and Hobbes. And that's what I always say about his work. It's what I think is the best part of his work. And to me, uh, someone said to me yesterday, you know what I love about this? It looks almost like Linus. Abraham Lincoln looks like Linus. And I was like, wow, I never thought of that before. He really does. No one tell the Charles Schultz estate that we will get sued. Nobody tell them that. Um, but obviously what I love about Chris is that, to me, what Chris can do more than anything else is he draws heart. It's easy to draw cute. It's a little harder to draw funny. But what Chris does is he draws heart. He makes you really feel it. So we start with Abraham Lincoln. And this is what I write. And this is toward the end of the book. Um, and in fact, you know, before we go there, I'll tell you one other story before we, before we hit that. So when we do Abraham Lincoln, now I, have to, I want to tell his story from his childhood. And, and again, we all know about him when he's grown up. But for Abraham Lincoln, for me, the best story is when he's 10 years old. Because when Abraham Lincoln is 10 years old, he, uh, he comes upon a group of boys who are playing with turtles. And he sees these turtles, and he loves turtles. He loves animals when he's a little kid. And Abraham Lincoln races up, and he's all excited. And he sees these boys, and what he sees is they're not playing with the turtles. What they're doing is they're putting hot coals on the backs of the turtles. They're torturing them. And Abraham Lincoln's... Show him, that's my son, so and show him the pictures. Again, only in my own family. The hecklers, right? Only my own kids can do that. The, um, and basically, in that moment... Abraham Lincoln looks at these boys and has to figure out what to do. And when you're 10 years old, it is hard to do the right thing. When you're 40 years old, it is hard to do the right thing. But someone has to. And in that moment, Abraham Lincoln looks at these boys, these bullies, and basically says, take the coals off the turtles. Saves the turtles. Stands up to the bullies. In that moment, shows you, right? There's, there is, there, that's the boy who will one day become the man that we know. And it's right there in that moment. And Abraham Lincoln, when I tell that story to my kids, to my youngest, he's like, I love animals. He's like, I want to be strong like him, Dad. And again, Abraham Lincoln, again, is not some black and white figure from a history book. But Abraham Lincoln matters again today. 
And so when we do I Am Abraham Lincoln, when we do I Am uh, Amelia Earhart, what we do is show you their lives, show you them when they're kids. Because to me, what you do when you see that is you see the power and the potential that's in all of us. And so you'll see in the book, um, as I showed you, this is page 40, and it says, it's a shot of Lincoln standing on what would be Martin Luther King Jr.'s podium at the Lincoln Memorial, but he's facing us. In other words, facing us with his back to the thousands of people uh, crowding the mall, all the way back to the Washington Monument. It's packed as it was during the March on Washington, like the Amelia Parade shot, this is the victory moment. And now Chris has to draw this. He has to figure out, take these words that I write as to what it's going to be and turn it into something that you're going to go, oh, I like that. Um, and this is what he hands me. And he just nailed it. First try. Sometimes we go back and forth, hands his pencil, and I'm like, that's it. That's exactly what I wanted to see. Um, quickly puts inks on it when we all say that we like it. And also uh, puts color on it. Now, what I'll show you, this is the important part, and I'm going to show you this because if you see this, If you can't see that closely, there's um, there's a family and a little man, uh, a little bald man, um, who looks really, really like me. Um, and what you'll see is uh, I basically I, I've become Waldo. That's it. I've really become. He's turned me into Waldo. Uh, and and uh, but you'll see what what we did do is we hid lots of things in this book. Um, there are lots of hidden little surprises for you. You I will challenge anyone to find them all. Um, we hit them all over, including uh, my favorite hidden number that I've hidden in every one of my books. And you'll have to find it, and you'll have to see it. And we put lots of little different puzzles and little clues for everybody in there. So hopefully that's the fun of it. And then after we do Abraham Lincoln, uh, my goal really is not just to say, let's do Amelia Earhart, let's do Abraham Lincoln. My real goal is what I want to do with these books is help you build a library. I want to help you build a library for your kids, for your grandkids, for your nieces, for your nephews. And the goal of that library is so you can give them values that you can be proud of, heroes that you can be proud of. So on the back of every book, it'll say what that value is. Each one is not just about their lives, it's about what they stand for. Abraham Lincoln says, I will always speak my mind and speak for others. And Amelia Earhart says, I, will, I know no bounds. And then you'll see that coming in June is the next book in the series. I am Rosa Parks. Here she is. And that was my reaction, right? Ah, oh, that's, I mean, that's it. And we, usually when we do covers... We drive Chris crazy. We, you know, he does 10 different covers for each one until we find exactly what we like. Should it be walking? Should it be sitting? Should we do anything? This is the cover that he handed in. And first draft, first time, we were like, don't touch a thing. It's perfect. And I am Rosa Parks, it says on the back, you know, and, and it's a very important part. It says that she will, I will always stand up for myself, a lesson I want my kids to learn. And after that, we do uh, Albert Einstein comes in September. And, um, and you, now we see the power of being different, right? I mean, Al, Albert Einstein, when he's a little kid, is weird. He's a weirdo. He's different than everybody else. And that, to me, is not something that we be, should be ashamed of, right? We are all different. That is what makes us special. And to me, that lesson needs to be carried over and over by our kids as they go on in their daily life. And I'll tell you, for me, um, the best story I can tell you happened to us a couple days ago. Because my youngest son was actually had this kind of bully situation where a kid was telling him where to sit in the cafeteria. My older son was hearing this, and he said to my younger son, you know, when I do these books, I let my kids read the books in advance because I test out all the stuff, make sure, and they're reacting to the right jokes. And my, young, my older son says to my youngest, you need to be like Rosa Parks. You need to stand up to that bully. And my wife is telling me the story, and she said, my youngest son then took him and says, I do. I need to be like Rosa Parks. And my wife has got tears in her eyes as she's telling me this story. And I've got tears in my eyes as I'm hearing it. I'm going, oh, my gosh, it's working. It's unbelievable. And I'm crying, and I'm going, no one on this whole planet will tell my young son that he cannot be an elderly black woman, right? <laughs> Nobody will stop him from being that. But the truth is, is, right, I want, I want, that, I want that for my son. That's my son. is like, I will be. I will be. Um, but I do want that for him. I want, I love, I love that to my kids, Rosa Parks is as important as she was all those years ago, that she stands for something. She's not just some, again, woman in an old black and white history textbook. She's something that matters today for us, and her lessons can be used and applied by us. That, to me, is how you find better heroes than what we see on the cover of People magazine or in Us Weekly or anywhere else. That's how you find real heroes. They're right in front of us. We just have to tell their stories. So that's where Ordinary People Change the World starts. Um, for me, it's a very simple philosophy. Whether you like it or not, your kids are going to pick heroes you might as well have some say in it. And so that's where we began. Um, with that, rather than talk on and on, and clearly because this crowd loves to talk, 
um, I'm going to ask you for questions. You can ask anything you want. Uh, you can ask about Decoded, about the novels, about anything else, and uh, we'll see where we go from here. Yes, sir? Think about possibly making a software. One, two, three. They can hear. That's for the internet. Don't worry. That's where they can hear you there. Okay. Did you think about making a software counterpart so the students can, I mean, the kids can click on a tablet or on a phone and customize it to them, to themselves, so to speak? Yeah. The question is, is um, can we take your books and let kids rewrite them for you? Um, yeah, no, they, uh, so, I uh, no, no, I'm joking, I'm joking. The, um, so, no, the, the truth is, is, is obviously, um, this is a very, very fair question, right? Is like, can we do a, an electronic counterpart? Of course we want to do that. Of course we want to do that. Um, so there is an ebook version that you can do. We're talking to them now about doing a more interactive version because I'd love to try and bring them to life. I think that's a great idea. Uh, and to me, our real hope, we have to start with this. And if you like them, um, you will get more of them. We right now are online to do six of them, uh, and I'll talk about the other two soon, but um, in a moment. But to me, the real goal is to let people and see how they react to that, and then the more we can, we want to build exactly that. That's exactly what we want to do. It's a great idea. And, um, and my hope is, is, you know, listen, I have my kids on Angry Birds too, like doing all day long, right? I would so much rather them doing, uh, learning about Amelia Earhart, learning about Abraham Lincoln, and learning those lessons. Because to me, if you want your kids off that computer and off that screen, you have to give them something better. You can't just complain and bitch and moan about it. You've got to give them something better. And so to me, what I said is, you know what? I'm going to do the best I can. I'm going to put a book out that's funny and that's engaging, that's interesting. And I can tell you, my 12-year-old who's in this room came to me a couple weeks ago and he said, Dad, can I read the Albert Einstein one now? And I was like, who are you and what have you done with my child? Right? But I, I was so amazed. Right, I was like, he, he was interested. He was engaged. And I'll tell you, in my house, that is a rare thing. My kids are not impressed with what I do. My daughter recently said to me, why does anyone want your autograph in their book? And I was like, you, you do see my name is on the cover, right? And she's like, yeah, I see my name on the cover too, Meltzer. I'm like, okay, that's how it is in my house. That a girl, right. Yeah, thanks, another relative. Um, and so... Um, the truth is, is obviously we'd love to do that. That is our goal to do it long term because I would love to compete uh, with all those things that currently steal our children's attention and try to the best of my ability. And again, these aren't my stories. I'd love to just share the stories of these amazing people. They're there. It's their story. Other questions? Yes. Yeah, no, the question is, is... What do you do when my daughter gets on the roof of the house, right? Um, yeah, no, no. Uh, I will tell you, don't don't get a crate on the roof of the house. That's the bad idea. No, we yeah. But if but if she had the planks of wood on the bottom, I might. It might be pretty awesome. Yes. Please. Yeah, no. Very fair question. The question is, is um, uh, again for, uh, on the comic book front. On that list of heroes that we're going to write about in the future are Siegel and Schuster, the creators of uh, Superman. On the, uh, they are absolutely on the list, 100% on the list. I'll tell you. Let's talk about the list for a moment. Who's coming? So uh, obviously, you heard Rosa Parks is next. Albert Einstein comes after that. Um, what we're debating on now. Let's take a vote here in this room. I like democracy. I, uh, I like Abraham Lincoln and Rosa Parks. So we're going to do a little democracy here, um, which is who we're debating on right now is Sacagawea and Lucille Ball. So if you want to see this, with show of hands. If you like one, raise your hand. Um, if you like Lucille Ball, raise your hand. Raise your hand. You like Lucille Ball? Okay. If you like Sacagawea, raise your hand. Uh, yeah, no, close. It's actually closer than I thought. Closer than I thought. I mean, listen, and then now here's the other one. For the last one, do you like better Neil Armstrong or Jackie Robinson? I'll tell you which one first. One guy raises his hand. I'm like, you don't know which one you're voting on. You're voting. <laughs> voting problems in Miami. What a, what a surprise, right? Um, so first, uh, if you want to see Neil Armstrong, raise your hand. If you want to see Jackie Robinson, raise your hand. Uh, I think it's, it's actually close, but Jackie Robinson for that. My son wants Jackie Robinson, and listen, the reason we did Amelia Hart first is because I did it for my daughter. Um, and Jackie Robinson I want to do for my son, so that'll probably be. And my goal is, is obviously, I want to do them all. Of course I want to do them all. I want to do Siegel and Schuster. Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster were two 17-year-old kids from Cleveland. They weren't good-looking, they weren't popular, but they gave us Superman. Two 17-year-old kids came up with the idea of Superman. That is a fantastic story. And to me, again, the most important part of the story is not Superman. The most important part of the story is Clark Kent. And you want to know why? Because we're all Clark Kent. 
We're all ordinary and boring, and we know what it's like to wish we can kind of rip open our chest and do something you know, that's spectacular. But the best news is we all can do something spectacular. We all can, and that's what they stand for, so I'd love to do them. They're, the only thing that will decide how many we do is how many books you guys buy here tonight. Um, so... <laughs> That's just the way it's going to be. No, I mean, you know, if, if we don't, if, if they don't buy enough books, if you don't buy enough books, um, I will hold you personally responsible. I don't mean as a whole total group. I mean, individually, I'll hate you personally, um, individually, one by one. But ob obviously, uh, that's our goal. Our goal is uh, we are on to do six right now and hope to do, I'd love to do 60 of them. I'd love to do a full library, and they're a part of it, naturally. Other questions? Okay, yes. Okay, here we go. Um... How do you compare Abraham Lincoln to Rosa Parks, and what do you think's different about them? Oh, that's actually, okay, so the question is, from my daughter, asking, I, I should tell my kids, ask me easy questions. It's so much better. Um, she asked a great question. Uh, how do you compare Abraham Lincoln to Rosa Parks, and, um, and basically, what, what do I... What's different about them? This is like this was my, uh, you know, my my history last exam in college asked this question. Um, you know, here's what I think: is that what I love about both of them? Um, Abraham Lincoln is almost unassailable in terms of character. His character is meticulous. It's an he's an incredible, incredible person who lives up to the hype. One of the few people in history where when you really pull it apart and you take all the myth making that we do with history because that's what we do right we build myths around these people when you die the myth becomes steve jobs suddenly is the myth he's a master he's a genius right i mean a lot of problems but we start we like myths we're a country that's founded on our legends and myths that's what we do and to me when you pull apart all the stuff we've written about abraham lincoln he's still incredible i mean i have a story in there uh, that i couldn't even put in there abraham lincoln's riding on his horse one day and he's got his you know someone else on his horse and they basically comes across he sees some birds that have fallen out of a tree and he stops the horses, stops the party, gets out, saves the birds, puts them back, uh, and rescues them. And, and as the people with him are like, well, you stopped the horse for that? Why, why'd you do that? And Abraham Lincoln says to him, because uh, if I left him, I, I wouldn't stop thinking about him. And I love that he just can't let that injustice or any harm to someone go. Um, one of my other favorite stories, in the book, Abraham Lincoln, right when he moves to Illinois for the first time, he comes upon a group of boys, bullies, called the Clary Grove Boys, little gang. And they're basically testing the new kid. They want to test the new kid, see how tough he is. And so what they do is, um, the way they used to test him is they, they would fight. And instead of having a fist fight, the, what they used to do back then is they used to wrestle. And the way wrestling worked back in the 1800s is you didn't take someone and, and you know, hold them down to the count of three. What you did was you would grip each other, and the rule was you couldn't break your grip. And then as you were fighting, whoever threw the other one down was the winner. So Abraham Lincoln's fighting a kid named Jack Armstrong, who's the biggest of their bullies in this group. And they're holding each other, and they're fighting, and Jack Armstrong cheats, lets go of his grip, grabs Lincoln by the leg, and chucks him. Abraham Lincoln goes flying. They're like, ha-ha, we won. And Lincoln gets up, and this is young Abraham Lincoln in a new town. And he basically gets up, and he's mad. And he's not mad he lost. Everyone loses sometimes. And you got to teach your kids that. Everyone loses sometimes. What he's mad is he cheated. And he gets up and he says, you cheated, you know? And they say, well, what are you going to do? You want to fight all of us? And, and he says, I'll fight every single one of you. Now, in all the letters, all the people that started crowding around, there's all these letters that show what happened that day. The one thing that they all differ on is no one knows why what happened next happened. They don't know if it's because Lincoln was calm about it. Some say he was really calm. Some say he was just so brave about it that he was willing to fight everybody. But the one thing that all the letters say that were there that day is after that, Jack Armstrong and, and this, group of, this, this group of bullies Look at young Abraham Lincoln and say, you're all right, ma'am. You're good in our book. And they later become not only friendly with him, they campaign for him when he runs for office. Wins them all over um, just with that. And so Abraham Lincoln, to me, is this amazing specter of you know just pure calm and confidence. Um, and I tell you that because, to me, that's the power of the ordinary person, right? It's not the president of the United States. It's not the guy who's in charge of the country. It's not the guy who brings everyone together from the Civil War. This is why he gets those things. And it's the same with Rosa Parks for me. Um, Rosa Parks just what I the, the difference between them to answer your question is Rosa Parks obviously finds herself in another amazing situation um, but Rosa Parks here's the difference she's not president she has no power she's not a business leader she's not anyone who you know can tell anyone what to do she's just an ordinary person and she's absolute proof that there's no such thing as an ordinary person um, and to me but again character they're so similar 
calm, they're so similar, but in circumstance, one has so much power, one has so little, but they still manage to move the entire world. And I love that about both of them. So is that good enough for you? Because if it's not good enough, I know you're going to tell me later. <laughs> Other questions? Good question, Lila. That was a good one. Yes, bud, what do you got? Okay, so the question is, is um, how old are you? Nine. So in, my, my friend, the nine-year-old, said that he has a book club in his school, and he wants to know if uh, I have any good books for his book club. Let me think. <laughs> I think for a nine-year-old, The Fifth Assassin is the right book for you. Yeah, yeah no, I, you got, go with Abraham Lincoln, man. I'll sign it for you. I'll do it. Um, I think you ever read Holes? Holes, you already read that one? Uh, you ever read Bone? That's a good one. You ever read, I'm gonna do another one that uh, that I loved. What else do I love? You read Wonder? That's a good book too, try that one. That's a good book. Um, I think there are great books that, that are out, especially for your age and especially for good readers. Um, I do think that The Fifth Assassin is pretty much right on target for you. Uh, and uh, you know, there's nothing like, what I, what I love about these signings is that people are bringing me like, the Fifth Assassin, and I am Amelia Earhart, and I'm signing both of them. And the kids are like, oh, Mom, what's that about? I'm like, death. It's about pure death. And, and in fact, the best part is, so, you know, we've gotten reviews on this book, and the reviews have been really just so super amazing. So I can tell you about this one awful one we got, which is that this uh, we got this terrible, terrible review for I am Amelia Earhart and I am Abraham Lincoln that together they said the problem with these books is it doesn't show uh, what happened to both protagonists in their bloody ends. And, and you need to show kids that if you want to be a hero, there's a consequence that comes with it. And I was like, oh, yeah, no, that's totally right, because I think what our kids need to learn is that if they're a hero, they could violently die or crash in the ocean. Yes, I think that's what we need. So if that's the ending you want to your book, I've brought a red pen, um, and I can draw that bloody end for you if that's so be what you want. The funny part is I, I did that. I, I, we were joking about that in New York, and, and Chris Eliopoulos, who's the artist, brought a red pen, and he was signing next to me as I was signing, and, and one guy came up. He's like, I want the bloody ending. And... and <laughs> So he's got the one of a kind uh, that you'll see. Um, so if you if that is the if that is the way you choose to ruin your child's life, yes. Go ahead, Jack. What do you got? No, yeah, this is a good question. So here, this is this may be the best. Okay, this is the best, right? I'm so happy we're taping this right now because this is my this is literally my cousin. Okay. How old are you? You're 12? 11. 11. Okay, I knew it close. So my 11-year-old uh, cousin who basically just said, you know, I started reading the Book of Fate, and I couldn't get through it. Can you write kind of shorter uh, books for me that I can understand? So no, thanks for totally publicly telling me that you don't like my books. I appreciate it. It's okay. It's, it's fine. Don't worry. And, um, and, and that it was just too hard for you to get through. Uh, it's okay. I'll, I'll just go be crushed now. Thanks, Jack. Um, Jack is one of the best readers in our family, uh, and I love that he's such a good reader. Uh, and I blame your parents, is what I really do. That's, that's what I do. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Sure, all good questions. So um, first question is, is why do you choose, say, Amelia Earhart versus the Wright brothers or Rosa Parks versus Martin Luther King Jr., right? Both have similar lessons. Um, why do you pick one over the other? And um, the reality is, is uh, I picked Amelia Earhart over the Wright brothers because of my daughter. My daughter liked her. It was purely selfish. Um, Lincoln coming next was, to me, the obvious choice as, as doing the first male one that we did. And, and I think Amelia Earhart also... To be honest, even without that, she's just a bigger icon than the Wright brothers are. She just uh, she just stands for something that's greater, I think, for especially for a lot of little girls. Um, but for Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King Jr., um, certainly I could have done it in any order. My goal is to do them all. Every person you just mentioned, I want to do. Um, and it was just a matter of saying we wanted to do a, a man and a woman right to start. We want to always do that. I want to keep it to that. Uh, so would love to do all of them. To your second question, I forget which I know. The living hero. So the question about living heroes. Um, you know, it's very tricky about living heroes. What I want to do is a lot of non-famous heroes. You know, there's a little girl named Alex Scott uh, who basically, uh, when she was one, less than one year old, she was diagnosed with cancer. 
And that was the only life she knew, Alexandra Scott. She knew chemotherapy and surgery and sickness. And when she's five years old, she says she wants to open up a lemonade stand in her backyard, in her front yard, I'm sorry. And what she wants to do is she doesn't want to take the money for herself. She wants to help and give the money to doctors to help other kids with cancer. Within a single day, Alex's lemonade stand raises over $2,000. But here's what I love. Suddenly, other lemonade stands start popping up, all with Alex's name on it. And then she sets a new goal eventually. She says she wants to raise a million dollars. On June 12, 2004, thousands of lemonade stands open up in every state in the country, ordinary people selling water and sugar and lemons to help kids with cancer. A few months after that, Alexandra dies. She's eight years old. Before she dies, she says next year's goal should be $5 million. To this day, Alex's lemonade stand has raised over $50 million. It is still going strong. One girl, one idea, one dream. That's a hero to me. Um, and a big one, and, and obviously not as famous as a Rosa Parks, but I want to tell Alex's story. And Alex's Lemonade Stand is one of the great charities out there that still goes strong. But as for living heroes, you know, it's interesting. Um, I can't say I'd never do it, but when I did Heroes for My Son uh, and Heroes for My Daughter, I had a couple living heroes in there. We had Nelson Mandela in there. I would have put Nelson Mandela in there. Obviously, he passed away, but I would have put him in there and felt okay about it. But the very last hero in Heroes for My Son when I was doing it and don't forget, my mom passed away from cancer, so there was a person who I picked out, and I said, you know what, this is a great person for what he's doing for cancer. And I wrote him up, and you, if you actually can find the preview copy of Heroes My Son, he's in the book. He's actually in the preview copy, a guy named Lance Armstrong. And as I looked at the proofs, and I was proofing it, I don't even know why, for no reason. This is, you know, almost 10 years ago now. But when I was looking through the proofs, I just said, you know, I just got a bad feeling. I don't even know why. I literally did. I just said, I just don't feel like it's a, I, you know what? Something could go wrong, and I'm just one bad news story away from regretting this choice. And obviously, I love what he's done for cancer. Raised so much money to help people with cancer. Um, but I think that's the risk you run when you do that living hero. Obviously, um, you know, we're all human. No one that I'll ever write about is perfect. No, we are all filled with flaws. Uh, and I think, you know, but when you pick someone who's alive, that's the risk you run. And then, I'm sorry, your third question was? Paperback versus hardcover. From a cost perspective, why do you do one than the other? Um, and it's a tricky one, right? Uh, I, I, can't, I don't even know why we do. I mean, our, my goal was obviously we want to do a nice presentation. We actually made it very inexpensive. This book is almost $10, right? I mean, that's as close to a price point. In fact, everyone has remarked to us, we, we picked a thinner uh, paperback cover because we wanted to keep the price down. And in fact, I wanted to go, when I had the Lincoln book, I wanted to go to more pages because I had more stories about him. And they said, if you keep going and you push another eight pages because you can't just add one, you have to do the whole set, um, the price is going to go up. And, and I was very conscious of families out there who can't afford to buy all these to keep that price down. So uh, it, it's more price conscious than you realize to try and make sure everyone can afford this for their kids. Okay, let's do one more question and then we'll sign some books. What do you got, buddy? How do you write a book? Well, why not? Um, so to me, what you do is you tell the story you love more than any other. That's how you write a book. Okay. You find the story that you have to tell, not that you want to tell, not that you think you could tell. You find the story that you must tell. And again, if I was a smart person, I should go write another thriller. It pays me more. But the reason I do these books and the reason I'm doing these books is because this is a story I feel like I have to tell. This is my heart in book form. That's what this is. And um, it's actually a perfect last question because it lets me tell you exactly that. Um, and so let me just say and end with a couple things. Um, is thank you for supporting the other novels. I'm working on the sequel to The Fifth Assassin right now, I should tell you that. Um, hopefully it'll be out next year and you'll see what Beecher and everyone is up to. Um, and I think if you want to start with that, The Inner Circle, if you want to try a new one, is a great place to start. Um, so try out The Inner Circle or even The Book of Fate. Except for you, nine-year-old Jack, don't try The Book of Fate. Because nine-year-olds should not be reading the Book of Fate. Oh, what do you got, Riker? Oh, I'm sorry. Riker's nine. Now everybody's right. Now, I've, now, now Riker and Jack are covered. You guys are both covered. Um, and to me, uh, what I really want to say is thank you for supporting those books because that's why I get to do these books. Last thing I'm going to say is for those, we have a lot of little ones here tonight in the front row. Um, for those who have bedtimes, because obviously it's Saturday night and it's late, what I did was is I pre-signed a bunch of books. They're all at the cash register. So if you have a little kid, just go to the cash register and ask for one of the pre-signed ones. You can have a copy pre-signed. If you have a really little kid and you want them to go first, the one thing I'll ask of the adults is let the little, little kids, like if you're seven and under, let's just make a cutoff, 
um, and you have a kid who's seven and under and you got to get out of here, please let them go first in line so that they can get out of here. Um, and with that said, again, the most important thing that I'll ever say always is thank you, thank you, thank you for supporting us. Thank you to everyone watching out there who supports us on Twitter and Facebook and all over the web, and thanks for coming tonight. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Listen, if you, as Brad said, if you've already got a book, you can start the line, goes through the back. He's signing in the other room. If you don't have a book, they're for sale at both registers.